Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of Lens with Advanced Design. My name is Hector Silva, and today we have the pleasure of hosting design educator Vincenzo Avacoli. A little bit about Vincenzo is uh, he has spent his career developing products, artworks, and interior projects for a worldwide clientele. Throughout his career, he has worked in academia internationally for 13 years. He has served as department chair of the product design department at the College for Creative Studies, CCS, in Detroit, Michigan, where he teaches and explores practices to advance industrial design education. In 2012, he received the Industrial Design Society of America Educational Award. Prior to CCS, he has also taught at universities in Japan, Italy, and Switzerland. And, uh, you know, the Arts, the Art Center College of Design in California. I'm going to let Vincenzo talk a little bit more about himself. Vincenzo, thank you so much for being here and for giving us your time to talk a little bit about your work, design education, and generally industrial design. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Hector, for the introduction and to invitation to give me the opportunity to talk in this web webinar. So uh, you were asking uh, about, uh, to talk a bit about the, the relation between uh, uh, education and uh, the industry. So, and I think that this is a kind of my expertise because I'm doing this since uh, many years. But let's start with some slides and we will go through them and so probably it will be easier to understand where I'm coming from and uh, where I'm, uh, and what I'm doing now. So let's start with this. I go on sharing the screen and I start. With this. And talking about education, I decided to call this presentation from road to remarkable. And this is related to the students. When they enter to the school and when they graduated, they are producing remarkable stuff. So as uh, Victor in Hector, as Hector introduced, uh, I work uh, in uh, and lives in many different places. So what I want to uh, explain today, introduce today, in this presentation, it's uh, some of the professional work that I've done with my partners, uh, Maria Luisa Rossi, and uh, some example that I've done in academia. I was lucky enough uh, to uh, live and work in many different places. I studied in Italy, in Florence, at a school called uh, ISIA. And then uh, after graduation, uh, you will see, you will see all the passage of the drive there. Uh, I was, uh, I moved to Tokyo where I was working and teaching at the University of Tsukuba. After that, um, I was uh, lucky enough to work in two great uh, uh, institutions in the United States, Art Center in Switzerland first, when they used to have a campus there, and then uh, in Pasadena. And uh, the past 13 years uh, at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. And for the past, uh, in, for all these years, I was the chair of the product design department. So, but let's go, uh, let's go back to the origin. And uh, I study in Italy, the, the kind of education that I had was more humanistic than technical. So I was following my professor and the mentor, Paolo Bettini, that we will talk about him in a second. And uh, he really was pushing us more to uh, solve the problems of <laughs> not about what to design, but uh, no, sorry. Uh, he was talking, uh, convincing us to work uh, not how to design things, but what to design. And we were working on a lot of uh, conceptual projects. So that one that you see on the left, uh, it's, uh, it's a project done for an uh, exhibition, and our theme was the uh, invention. So we came out with two conceptual project, one was a dress, one was a finger pen. So I, don't, I will not go deep in the details of this project, but I want to talk about the things that I learned from this project. So uh, when we, the first model was presented to the uh, exhibition, the model was rejected. 
So uh, the, as a team of students, we were very disappointed. We decided to do a new models, a new five days, uh, using the expertise around us, using the fabulous uh, uh, craftsmen that it was possible to find in the city of Florence, we make a, a completely different models. So when we arrived to the exhibition, everybody was astonished. And to make a long story short, uh, with that project that was presented in the exhibition, we got two covers on uh, two international magazines, one in Japan and the other one uh, that was Domus, that was uh, a kind of uh, uh, extremely important uh, design magazine at that time about art, architecture and, and design. So we were on the cover and you can barely recognize me. This was many years ago <laughs> with a group of students. And this was uh, the kind of approach I was at that, at that moment, I was still, uh, let's say, a sophomore. And uh, to be there, it completely changed my life because the people start to realize that anyway, as a group of students, as a designer, as a young students, uh, we were able to do uh, mag magnificent stuff. So continuing that process, uh, my thesis degree, I worked on uh, the project that you see on the right, it's a wearable computer. So in, in, uh, in one image, you can see, you can see uh, how it was possible to use this device. And in the other images on the button, you can see how, you, uh, how it was possible to disassemble and wear on the body as a piece of a jewel. So um, again, what, what we learned from the first experience that the model was rejected, we learned that uh, to succeed, uh, it, it's important to work in the project in every single details and everything should be extremely well executed. So nice concept, great concept, uh, uh, all the representation, all the drawings, all the, uh, the models uh, and all the photos that, uh, were important to the success of this project. Of course, again, this project were not for manufacturing, but was uh, to was a research to uh, bring the company to uh, to give new direction to the uh, industry to follow. So, according to that result and those uh, uh, splendid photo and the concept behind, uh, this project was extremely well. Uh, extremely successful and was published more than 80 times all around the world. So this became, uh, in few words, uh, uh, my portfolio pieces. Uh, this project was known everywhere, was published in fashion magazine, design magazine, and uh, without the portfolio, everybody knew uh, what I was doing. That was quite amazing. It opened me a lot of doors. Um, and last but not least, in 2018, that means 34 years after the, this project was done, became a, a part of the permanent collection of the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn next to Detroit. So this is the beginning. And uh, uh, this was also my thesis that I worked with a team of friends and classmates and other people, but was my thesis that I submit for two degree from the school. And uh, uh, so that was an opportunity to, uh, what would, was sent to a competition and uh, we end up to be the winner of one section of that competition. So this provide us the opportunity to go to visit Japan in 1985. And uh, you can recognize uh, me and Maria Luisa as I introduced before, most of the work that you will see the professional work we done or are done in collaboration with, uh, with Maria Luisa was the opportunity to go to Japan, incredible experience. And at that time we start to build the, our network with that country. So the other things very important that uh, uh, when I graduate is that uh, uh, I didn't add many industrial products in my portfolio. This was the, the working office was the most important. Uh, the, my drawing skills were average, computer skill zero, and uh, at that time there were no computers. This was 1984, 
and uh, the Macintosh, uh, just to give an example, the Apple Macintosh was introduced into the market in 1984, the same year when I graduated. But I had a great passion, already a reputation, and a series of principles that my mentor, Professor Paolo Bettini, that you have seen in the cover of Domus Magazine, introduced to us, introduced to me, and stayed with me since then. This principle that you can uh, read uh, and I can uh, introduce uh, are something that uh, I learn and I try to introduce to my students uh, when I am teaching them and mentoring them. I, I prefer more the word mentoring than teaching. So, and these are be curious, be open mind, push boundaries, exceed expectation, cultivate dreams, promote exchange of ideas, develop captivating narrative, build the partnership with professional. This is something that uh, uh, can be very familiar for many of you, but at that time uh, they were not. <laughs> so, but very important for what uh, happened in the following of our career. So after graduation, I'm going step by step. I know that in the audience are a lot of students because I've seen the other presentation of lenses and, uh, and everybody in the family say, I'm a student, how can I build a career? So this is a case study that uh, uh, how I built my career many years ago. So after graduation, especially coming out of graduating from Italian school, the goal was not to go to work in a company, but to most of the graduates wanted to create their own companies. So, and uh, they signed something and to try to find a producer for the design. And this was mainly done in the furniture industry. There's a preeminent industry in, uh, in Italy and it still is. So, uh, and simple product, easy to manufacture and so on, low, low technology and so on. So the first uh, pieces that we, we put in production were this uh, mannequin produced by a company called Zeus and uh, these tables done by Ravarini Castoldi. This was just the beginning for us to say, okay, we are designers, we, we produce a lot of concepts, but we can also do something for production. Uh, proceeding, this is another uh, uh, product that we designed uh, after we were invited to an exhibition. The beginning of the 80 in Italy was very sparkling time. There were, in Milano, there were the movements that probably are familiar, Memphis, Alchemia. We were in Florence, but at that time, the Italian design was leading an inspiration for, from the rest of the world. So a lot of uh, sparkling, a lot of activities, a lot of uh, young people try to do different things. So, and there were a lot of exhibitions and we were invited to one of them, the, 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 the theme was about tableware, and we came out with this uh, collection of bottle tops. So we went to a craftsman that helped us to do the, to do the model, and he was doing the copper, the overall shapes. Then uh, we were, I, I was going to take the model and bring it to another one, another craftsman who was doing the silver plate. And then we were finishing putting the cork inside. So we also were part of the production of this. In the exhibition, we find a German distributor that wanted to distribute in Germany. So, and he wanted to have a really big production. They started to say, can you produce a thousand of these? Of course, these were handmade by by this old uh, craftsman. So we went back uh, and we asked him if he was uh, interested to do big production. And uh, he, he, his answer was yes. So we started to be the producer of this. And it was very interesting to do the uh, uh, design of the stuff that you like to design, to be entrepreneur, <laughs> to do the design, to do the production, and to support the distribution. And we learn so much. So in all the stuff that you will see, there are all different case studies and in each of them we learn, we learn a lot. It's also interesting that uh, at that time the internet was, uh, was probably a dream and there were not a kickstart. So the, this is why you see simple product where it was possible to invest personal money to make, to make a prototype. So, but this was incredible experience. The production started follow for, for a while and there was talk when I moved to Japan, it was impossible too. 
take care of uh, the quality of the products and the customer care. These were handmade, so sometimes going to Germany, the German client didn't accept that there was some dots or something that was not very well finished. So, but this is all the learning experience that helped us to do what we have done after. Another uh, incredible client that we had was a movie director that asked us to design a furniture for a movie. And Mephisto Funk was the first fully digital movie done in Italy. And we designed a collection of pieces that when, uh, were also used for the studio of the movie director that we designed the studio. So we also were doing some interiors for him, for that company. The big switch was when, in 1988, I was invited to teach in Japan. And uh, I was working at the University of Tsukuba, but also had the time to do some uh, consultant work. And I started to have uh, clients like this, like uh, TDK, to design, in this case, a, a product that uh, probably some of you they never seen, <laughs> but they were very popular, cassette tapes. And uh, that was uh, in the year, a, a project that lasts for a year. And we work uh, in a team uh, designing, uh, the, doing the design for a line of uh, cassette tapes uh, for different targets, and then the packaging, uh, and then the branding and so on. So here is just one of the prototypes that they made. But I also, uh, I was digging in the past and I saw this, uh, this photo. I find very appealing uh, to see how we were working and it remind me a lot of a photo that you see in the, in the history of uh, design where you see the maestro uh, in the studio with tie jackets, uh, everybody smoking a uh, lot of cigarettes and so on. This is the work environment at the time. And uh, in a way, I was part of that. Uh, another product that came out uh, when we were in Japan was uh, a, a collection of tableware that we did for this company called Wakita. And the collection include, uh, include uh, the set, the soya salt, uh, uh, soya sauce, salt and pepper, the water pitcher, ice pail, uh, and it was very interesting that we also designed a chopstick that was uh, kind of interesting that some foreigners designed chopstick for Japanese very challenging, very interesting. And again, uh, every project was a learning experience that we applied to something else. Uh, I, when we were there, we, we were also involved to do a completely different project, different scale. So you have seen some uh, products, then we worked a lot of public art and we did a lot of these pieces. And then you will see that we also work on, on uh, uh, quite a few interiors. So the interesting thing here is that we started a collaboration with an architectural firm called Nikken Seke. Nikken Seke is one of the biggest in the world. Uh, at that time, they had 1,700 architects. I did the search, now they are around 2,200. And they, they are designing most of this building in, uh, and skyscraper in, in Asia. So it was very interesting because they were doing the architecture. We were doing the artwork for them. We were providing, we were providing the, the, the design. Then we were working with a contractor that was doing the construction drawing. <laughs> because you can imagine, this is a very complicated stuff. Think of this. The, the bigger cone that you see, the blue one, is 35 feet. You can see the, the proportion with, with, the, with the man nearby. So, uh, and of course, we were not able to do the engineering part engineering part of this project. So it was nice to work with those kind of uh, contractors to, to on this uh, big scale projects. And uh, you can see the construction, the, the structure in aluminum. And when we were going there to check every single details and putting the, the blackboard and, uh, and taking photo of us, which again, the designers came on that day to check. So we have done really quite a few. And, uh, and you can see all the steps. So this was also interesting that uh, to, 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 to make, uh, to get the approval from the city of Tokyo, they did the full scale models. And then they flew me from Italy to check, uh, to check uh, if the proportion were right and so on. Uh, interesting things, you can see in the photo bottom left, uh, the photo down whaling ceremony with, uh, 
with, uh, with the pressing of Sanyo and the three of us with the white gloves, uh, signs of respect. Uh, all the experience, I can tell you, were amazing. The last project that I want to show that we did professional, and this was also more or less at the time, it's, uh, it's a restaurant. We have done uh, quite a few interiors, but this was uh, uh, particularly successful in terms of business for the restaurant and in terms of reputation for us. Uh, it's called Kabuto, that uh, inspired by the, the top of the lead of the pot that we generated. It's a Shabu Shabu restaurant. And for this, we design everything from the design of the interior the design of all the pieces, pan, pots, uh, lids, uh, chairs, uh, cooking tools. Uh, and then we were also the art director for the fashion designers that decide the uniform for that restaurant and for the graphic design, they decide the brand for that restaurant. So all the stuff that I was telling before, you must have a great project and then you must have a great contractor, great manufacturer a good client first, then a good manufacturer, then you need a good photographer. All this stuff were applying this project. So we had a great client that was Kirin, then we had a great uh, contractor that was Taka, uh, Takashi Maya, that was the, the most uh, um, successful in, uh, in Tokyo at that time. The photographer was Nakasa and Partners, that they were photographing all the interiors, uh, artwork, uh, during the economic boom in Japan of this time. So the combination of this created, at the end, we had a fantastic package to give to the media. Similar to that one that was done when we were students with the working office that got that kind of success. This more or less accomplished similar success. And uh, we all was published everywhere. We are talking before internet. And we also got five covers in the magazine, uh, starting from left to right in Japan, Taiwan, uh, Italy, uh, Korea. And the last one is a book of standing by the restaurant design that was published in France eight years after the project was done. So uh, this was quite an accomplishment for our studio. If you think that our studio was composed by two people. <laughs> so, and, uh, and uh, both of us were doing the design. I was also in charge of, of uh, the marketing, the promotion, but also to get new clients. So you can imagine the kind of uh, uh, stress uh, on uh, two people to have this kind of presence as a big studio, this kind of reputation, but all the work behind was very impressive. So when, uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, I was also teaching in Japan, and before moving back from Japan and when visiting other institutions, I went to visit Art Center in Pasadena, and I realized that uh, in education, that I was uh, also, I was very interested in education because I was involved with education since uh, uh, when uh, I graduated, there was a space, there was a room for my expertise to fill the gap between education and the industry. And when I realized that, I jumped on that opportunity. So uh, I start to, uh, when I started to work for our center, I was teaching and uh, traveling all around the planet, all around the world, uh, the, doing that kind of project that you have seen. And of course, if you can see more, you can go to the, if you want to see more, you can go to the website. And then try to bring my know-how in the education setting in something that uh, are called sponsor project. <laughs> it's pretty simple. So what we will see now, I will show just a couple examples. I will not show so many projects that were done in my classes, but uh, if you are interested, there is a link at the end because now, Another big project that I'm doing, I'm putting together an Instagram page that's called Vincenzo underline edu. I'm putting to, uh, put, posting the projects done in my class since day one when I start to teach. So now it's uh, taking ever because a lot of projects I have the slides, so it should be duplicated and then should be posted. But if you want to go to see more, you can go that, and then you can also recognize. Uh, uh, some names that now are very famous design. So what I want to focus now is a couple of projects that were done at uh, CCS uh, 
recently, and they are based on these two uh, pedagogical objectives, the solid relation with the industry and the research institution, and the interdisciplinary exposure. So the first one, it's, um, it, this is uh, pretty recent, was done uh, uh, less than two years ago, uh, was sponsored by uh, General Motors. I am a big fan of uh, this relation with the industry, as I introduced already, because uh, it gives uh, the professional support to the students to, be, to learn more in terms of know-how, but also in terms of professionalism. When I talk about sponsored project, it's not, uh, uh, I don't like those projects where the company give an assignment and they want to have uh, some precise outcomes and means to, to be in competition with uh, our graduates, with uh, other young designers, because uh, whatever uh, it, we are able to produce in the class, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a lot. So I, I don't like the kind of approach that they come to exploit the, the, our students. But this project is quite interesting. So General Motors, of course, is not, uh, is not involved in furniture and so on. And uh, they came uh, us uh, and, uh, and we put together a group of uh, product design students and uh, entertainment arts. And they collaborate in teams to create a, a branding experience for the year 2013, which embodies the essence of General Motors brand. In this case, uh, it's uh, Cadita. So each group was working on three typology of products, seating, tables, and lighting. So in this case, we will see one project, the students was focused on Cadillac. These are the three products that they designed. And uh, of course, this was a, 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 an approach very different from what eventually do in every class uh, in a design school, you know, to try to find a need and then how to manufacture a, uh, how to manufacture the products, uh, all the restriction. This was about uh, you know, new vision for the brand. And so the, even though in some cases the students start to be conservative and start to sketch, suddenly everybody realized that this project was very different from the other. So what it means to redefine in the case of Cadillac, the, 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 what luxury is, what is the lifestyle, what is the loyalty, what, why the client like uh, that brand. And those ones that eventually they cannot afford the Cadillac. So this attainability, how to arrive to a point they are able to get a Cadillac. So exploration about, uh, about forms and, uh, and when they start to do the, the mock-ups for this was not about the products, but about uh, about uh, scenarios to really develop a new typology of products, even though you know the, 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 the team was asking uh, the, about the chairs, tables, and so on. So they came out with uh, these three products that you can see here. But the interesting things, and this is the part of the collaboration with, uh, with uh, Entertainment Arts, that the, 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 the five students, three products to Entertainment Arts, were working together to accomplish, uh, to learn from each other. Everybody learns from each other because you can understand that the process in film is different than from product and vice versa. So at the end, uh, they also developed together the concept for a movie that, uh, for a video, <laughs> that is attainable luxury, showcasing the green hustle and the power to obtain luxury we want to live. And it was a call to action. Envision your ideal lifestyle and work until uh, you achieve it. So, Let's watch this video, it's two minutes, but uh, I can tell you that when we arrive at the end at the final presentation in the auditorium with all the sponsors who are about uh, Detroit is in, uh, uh, GM is in Detroit. So there were a lot of people, top manager from, uh, from the company. And so this video, I think uh, everybody was uh, kind of astonished. Let's see if it's run smoothly.
So starting from the bottom to arrive to the top, from row <laughs> to remarkable. This was incredible experience. You can imagine that also for, for the students in product to learn the techniques, how to make a movie, but also how to hire the actors, how to get the materials, how to put everything together, what is that? It was an incredible experience for everybody. And, uh, and uh, when you have a, a sponsored project, there is also uh, another big plus that eventually there are some uh, funds for additional initiative. And we were able to bring uh, two teams uh, to New York uh, to uh, want a design that was part of the ICFF uh, in New York. Uh, last year. I know that in the audience there are someone that participated to this field trip, so eventually can uh, add something uh, through the notes if they are interested. Um, let's proceed with the last project I want to show. Uh, this is uh, done uh, really last semester uh, that was impacted by the COVID and uh, I had this idea that I wanted to work on the uh, energizing the future of mobility, working on uh, refueling and refilling. And uh, our corporate relation office at CCS was kind enough to find a sponsor in Exxon. And so we started the project in January. And uh, again, you know, it's uh, when the sponsor come, uh, they want to have uh, some products that are useful for them to make more money. But the students were more uh, responsible and they start to work on completely new scenarios, especially not only in the pump, and how to sell more premium, but in the reorganizing completely a service station that is obsolete and need uh, and the space uh, to uh, it enhance the services uh, beyond uh, just uh, gas and fuel. This is a project done by students that was considering how to work on the service station with tensile structure to transform during uh, seasonally or even faster daily in this case uh, day and night because day and night they have a two different function and to use uh, during the night with uh, different purposes another project that came out was uh, more uh, related to the pumping and uh, but it was uh, also uh, influenced by whatever was happening during the semester that when it was the COVID. so this is a, a and not so that, of course, uh, this is uh, something that is never uh, redesigned since many years. And this was uh, more uh, cleaner just to avoid the, the, the germs, the virus and so on. They instead to push the button in the pump and then to take the nozzle, uh, the interface uh, completely redesigned. But also was introduced, uh, as you can see in the bottom left, the ultraviolet sanitizer system that every time the nozzle is used, you can bring back and they can be sanitized. Another project that was uh, presented, it's uh, the fully reorganization of the traffic flow at the service station, fully reorganization of whatever is uh, service station, including new services. And on the right, you can see also how the car can be uh, um, refueled or recharged by arms, by robotics. And this, of course, it's also related to the fact that in the future, when the car will be autonomous, it's not necessary to go the, to, to refill, but you can go home and the car can go by itself to be refueled or recharged according to when will arrive to that kind of goals. So this is also the last project, but now just some final consideration that happened when uh, when we were doing this project, when we started, there was, uh, we were living in, in a completely different environment. But uh, in start, uh, this was the beginning of January. But then the, we realized how the climate change is in, in, was impacting us with all the events that uh, stronger than what we experienced in the past, the wildfire, the multiple floods and so on. And then we had, the coronavirus that spread out around the world and this started in February in some region and here in, uh, around the world in March 2020. So this uh, uh, created such a big impact that uh, of course the consumption of gas was fully reduced and uh, April 4 the news was the price of barrel crude oil went negative. So this has a big impact in whatever was happening 
Uh, and so if uh, we were working in a new direction and uh, thinking in a more responsible way about the project, if there was a kind of skepticism at the beginning, then that became a priority. So what I want to say, and this is my last <laughs> remark, is that the past six months were very challenging for uh, all of us. COVID-19 completely changed our lifestyle and uh, force us to reframe our point of reference and goals. In every field, the pandemic accelerated this process and the necessity to develop more sustainable scenarios where designers can play a big role, a very significant role. Definitely, design education has a big responsibility in educating the new generation that will shape our future. And this is why it's very important to consider what to design versus how to design. And this is also the end of my presentation. Uh, there are some links here if you want to see more. Uh, Yavico.com is the website, uh, Vincenzo uh, underscore edu is where you can see uh, the product done uh, by students in my class and that will be populated uh, slowly. And uh, the other Instagram is where I put uh, a lot of photos related to my trips worldwide. And this also concludes my presentation. Hector, where are you? I stop it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um... Fantastic. I stop share. Perfect. Okay, now I can see you. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing um, your work and the work of your students. And uh, I think we have some very, um, some very heavy topics to talk about. Like nice. Your last slide um, definitely makes us think a lot with everything that's happening. But I do have a couple of questions here, and I do encourage the audience to also ask questions in the Q&A part of this uh, Zoom session. But one of my first questions, as I was sitting and enjoying your presentation, this came to mind. Um, you traveled around the world, you taught at different universities, but even before teaching, you were working um, you know, for different companies um, around the world. and. Uh, I'd like to know how, how important is it for designers to have a global perspective? Crucial. If you talk to me, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, extremely important. And uh, for example, I was uh, based in Italy at that time. I was lucky enough that uh, I was speaking English. So now you are lucky here because speaking English, you have this big advantage. It's a kind of a global language. But uh, in your case, it's not the case of the language, but the case of perspective. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things that uh, I was really pushing, uh, and uh, I hope will continue now, unfortunately, COVID also stopped that, the international exchange. Because there's a great opportunity for uh, the students when they are still in the school to get, uh, to take advantage, advantage of those opportunities. So it was happening, more and more exchange, and then uh, this, uh, uh, the winter semester because of COVID, they were all forced uh, to uh, come back uh, and I heard the news that for next year, all the uh, study abroad are canceled. Extremely important. Now, now, I mean, so think of this. When I started, there was no internet. <laughs> now you have everything in front of you, but also when we started the production, now the uh, uh, found racing, the Kickstarter, and uh, to promote something on the web, uh, it's, uh, it's much easier than what used to be at that time. Yes, but I think um, if I had the opportunity to trade the internet over, go and travel the world, I think I would take the world and travel. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, to have both is even better. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, in your presentation, you also talk about how when you first got into design education, there was a gap between academia and industry. And I always talk about that gap because that's the reason why I got into academia. And I would like to know if you feel that that gap is worse or better now. It depends from the institution. Mm. Depends uh, when, when I mention uh, 
uh, when I mention that uh, I find that fit at our center, I find a similar seat at, at the fit at CCS. There are some other institutions where the importance and the connection with, uh, with the industry is extremely important. If you think the program at the University of Cincinnati, the co-op, that is again, you know, it's another, another big priority. They consider extremely important. They must uh, have uh, several internships to graduate. The program is five years, so it's uh, extremely important. The other program where they are more conceptual and then when the students graduate, they have to find their own way. It's a different approach. I cannot say which one is better, which one is worse. When, uh, when uh, I graduated, I was in the school, the approach was, uh, in my case, more conceptual. Mm -hmm. But other programs were. What I can see here, that the majority of the time, the technical aspects are overwhelming uh, other things. And in fact, when uh, years ago, when I was, uh, uh, asking to the students uh, what uh, what was necessary to uh, have uh, in the campus to be more creative, I mean, the, the answer was always more computer. This was uh, a, a change. I switched the mind. It's okay, you want a more computer, and I strongly believe that the computer does increase the creativity. <laughs> so. I start to, re to reduce whatever was possible to do. There are uh, some uh, schools that are focused on uh, drawings. They put a lot of emphasis, other schools not. Of course, uh, I didn't uh, study, I didn't learn much drawings, but uh, I think that it's important. So this is why when I was the chair, drawing was important part of the program. Of course, all the skills that you have to learn, you must learn. Uh, the, the 3D modeling because without those it's uh, it's like the language you know I mean it's, you must have those those is a basic requirement but after you learn on those skills you know there is a possibility to be to learn other skills the soft skills that start to be even more important now because the COVID really changes the status quo of the situation you cannot present yourself in a company with a bunch of good sketches if you don't have the the thought behind that can be appealing for those companies to hire you because everybody's the same problem. They don't know what to do. They want to have fresh idea in which direction to go. So what I was starting to do that I was forced to do when I was a student and I applying whatever I've done in my career, now is even more important. Absolutely. We have a question here from, uh, from someone in Italy who was asking. Hey, why is that? <laughs> he, why is that? He wants to know, if, uh, do you think that design will have much more space of action or if engineering will take its place? Oh, no, no, I think that uh, whatever is happening, if we play the role properly, we'll have much more space. Hmm. Because engineers, they have a completely different approach. We must, uh, if we study, we act, and we learn, we read, uh, and we approach in a holistic way, we have much more space. Mm -hmm. Engineers, uh, I mean, we cooperate with them, but uh, each area is the mind setting. So this is why when I show the, the interdisciplinary projects, it's not everybody became fluent in whatever, but it's important to understand different set of expertise and learn the language to communicate, communicate with the others. Because, you know, anyway, you have to work with other people, you have to work in team. But I'm pretty sure that working in a proper way, designer, if they are trained in a proper way, there's not just the technicality of how the things are done and how to solve problems for production, but we try to solve the problems in a more holistic way, the wicked problems, they are much larger, we will have much more space. Absolutely. We have a question here from, uh... Actually, you might know this designer. His name is Matteo. And uh, his question is, uh, Don't talk with <laughs> what are the biggest mistakes students make during their time in school? So, um, the, I cannot call mistakes, you know, because also we are talking about different generation and the, the, the each generation is different. If I think the student 10 years ago, they are much different from the student that I have now. But uh, the, 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 the connection that they have with technology sometimes is a bit too much. So I always push and I try to help them to have this kind of uh, personal relation that you have the op opportunity when you are in college to practice as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Talking about the background in, 
I didn't want to talk this time, but now it's I'm back. What I consider one of the most important classroom for me was the Italian square, the Italian piazza. It's the place where the people meet together, talk, gather, and do. And when I was going to Italian piazza, it was before the technology, before the the laptops before the phones, iPhones and whatever, the smartphones, the talking and what we were doing, I do this comparison with the design process that I was doing when I was not a designer, when I was a teenager, we were going with the scooter in the piazza, we were sitting there and then there were uh, a guy that was having the Vespa and another one, Lambretta, there's another kind of skill. We were sitting there and we were doing the X-ray of the product. Mm. And when we finished to do that, we were doing X-rays of the shoes. And then we were doing X-rays of fashion X-rays. That means so we were going in a deeper conversation. So that was a kind of research that we were doing analysis, synthesis, brainstorming to arrive to some ideas that a lot of time those ideas we were considering those people crazy now if we do something similar in the science school it's not craziness it's a, to have the visions mm. so that kind of conversation that we were having uh, sitting for hours doing nothing in fact at a certain point is i cannot do this anymore because i have a life in front of me i want to get out of this but the kind of deepness of those conversations thinking about the product around you in a certain way, it's something that it's very difficult to happen in any design school. Okay. Um, you were the chair of the Department of Product Design at CCS for yes, quite some time, 13 or so years. Many. And, uh, <laughs> CCS is regarded as one of the best design schools in the country. I would love to hear about the secrets. Why are students so successful at CCS? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a hard work. Mm -hmm. We try to instigate, you have seen uh, passion, mm -hmm. passion to, the, to create the motivation to really have the passion. Uh, raw, when I talk about raw, a lot of students arrive there, they don't know what product design is. So, and uh, now I am in, talking with a lot of students uh, in the classes, I'm asking them what uh, brought them to product design. And uh, a lot of them, they didn't know anything about, uh, about product. They, were, they went to CCS because they are teachers. They, oh, you can do a nice pot and go to uh, study ceramic at uh, CCS. So eventually if they were able to draw, they say they sent to illustration and so on. But when they write to see, the, the, the CCS, to perceive that kind of atmosphere that was offered in the department, seeing all the work around, the kind of creativity and, and the career opportunities, that is, is a big incentive. Of course, I always tell to the students that that one is not, the success is not granted. Mm -hmm. You have to build that. And uh, if you don't put the hours, if you don't put the work, if you don't put a passion, because the thing is that when you put a passion, it's not work. It's a passion. So you can work 18 hours and it's okay because you are right to something. You are that kind of personal gratification. So this is the first thing that I was trying to introduce to every student there, the passion. So if you have a passion, you can work on it. And it's a kind of how the curriculum is organized and make it successful. And in 13 years, I can tell you, I create a lot of stuff because uh, before I arrived, uh, the product design department that exists was a part of industrial design that at that time was uh, combined with, uh, with transportation. So I, I was hired with the goal to build the identity of product separate from transportation. And this happened during the year. So if I think of uh, uh, whatever happened, the student show that didn't exist at the time, and there were some experiments but were not successful. Now, when uh, you, if you have the chance to go to see the the student show at CCS, it's uh, it's amazing. We do for the department, uh, and uh, we were doing for product at a certain point, and then uh, it was uh, expanded to other departments. And if you go to see that one in May, when you see the work of all the 
students from every department is extremely impressive. So starting with the passion, you can build on top of that. But of course, hard work and also another thing that I was uh, uh, trying to do to set up the goals for the students. If you set up the goals, you can you work and you have a direction. Because what I find that before they were doing, they didn't they didn't know why they were spending so much time working, because they didn't see what, why I'm doing this. But if you say okay, if you go through this because you can accomplish something else that is more sophisticated, something bigger, then it became much easier for them to invest the time in the stuff that they should learn. Yep. Um, I have a couple of more questions and we can wrap up our conversation. Um, 2020 has been a very strange year, kind of like on your last slide with a lot of uh, environmental disasters. That was, that was January. Then a lot of things happened after that. If we see what's up in California and in Oregon. <laughs> it started in January and uh, feels like the year will never end. But um, everything that's happening and... Um, Design education has been impacted. Uh, schools have opened, there's hybrid courses. Some schools are, are fully teaching their classes online. As an educator, um, do you feel that this might be something that now we have to adapt to? Or how do you think design education would be impacted? For sure we should adapt. But this is also an opportunity to completely rethink uh, education worldwide and especially here in the United States because I don't think they're sustainable mm -hmm. <laughs> if you think about the cost and so on so it's uh, it's unbelievable and then uh, you can also realize that uh, there are a lot of cases when we have students that arrive to CCS they can draw they can uh, they know a lot of things and they learn from internet so the idea that we have this kind of schools so that cost a lot of money eh? I think that uh, I'm talking for what I heard, we are forced to change. And I can see a lot of positive things. I don't know if you have a, uh, if you heard about the certificate that Google is putting together that you can uh, practice with $400, you get the certificate that help you to get a job eventually to them and so on in a much shorter time, $400. So the cost of education in, in US went a bit so far. So of course, I can see a lot of positive thinking and positive things in this uh, distance learning. In fact, I had a possibility, I'm teaching some classes uh, uh, that can be fully taught online. If uh, you don't have the physical uh, stuff that you have to do and you, had, you don't have to go to school, why not to create, uh, to create uh, online classes? So we should get used but uh, I'm also uh, familiar with this because uh, a lot of projects that I show, they were done remotely. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing those kind of projects, there were no internet. So at that time, the most advanced tool was the facts. That if I talk about facts, a lot of people, they don't know what is that. But, uh, and the advantage to being between Italy and Japan was that uh, I was working all day I was submitting the work in the night and they were working overnight and then I was receiving by fax the material back. So that kind of experience opened also a lot of doors. So, and I think that it's another package that we add on top of the education of our students and how many people are working remotely and how many people realize that it's more efficient to work in that way. So it's important to understand to retrain a lot of people and CCS has given us this opportunity to, to make uh, some classes online to take, uh, and I was one of them, a volunteer to take, and then I was teaching to other faculty how to create uh, uh, online courses. And uh, I jump on that opportunity. And uh, what I can see that uh, my students uh, uh, appreciate a lot that kind of organization. And of course, there are some classes, and especially in some other departments where you cannot do much online, but you have to go in person to use the labs. And the labs is some of the, of course, uh, the, uh, all of the schools in the United States uh, are selling as a plus. In, uh, in, in Italy, we don't have uh, schools with this kind of resources, this kind of facility. If I show the school where I studied, it's nothing. <laughs> but if you see the results mm -hmm. 
are amazing. So this is why I think that uh, reducing uh, some of the resources, you can increase the creativity. Yeah, it's um, it's very difficult. I think you brought you bring up a really good point. Like the Google, um, you know, certification program is a very good example of how uh, someone can. There's an alternative way of of getting educated, and I think here in the United States. Um, schools are having a difficult time trying to convince students to continue paying the same type of tuition with an online experience. And um, well, the bigger, the, the biggest issue there is why is school so damn expensive in the United States? That's a whole nother issue. Um, but with COVID happening, you know, uh, education is a business and how do you, you know, how do you, um, how do you continue supporting your students and how do you convince them that, hey, you are investing in the right thing? How many business must be completely reorganized? COVID, boom, open the door. And now we, we see what we create so far. And if there's something that's not sustainable, we'll collapse. Who is already sick will die. So the thing is that this is opportunity. I say from the beginning, it's when I say this, you know, people, not everybody's happy, but uh, this is a great opportunity to reinvent uh, education from uh, the beginning. Because if we say it's not sustainable, it's not sustainable, you know? And so we reorganize. We have seen what happened with, uh, in other, with other services. Let's think of the, 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 the Uber, the Lyft, uh, the, the what's happening in the US, they are very effective. In other countries, they are putting barrier because they worry to lose the business. So when this happens, you must be fresh to provide a proper alternative to survive. And this is the opportunity that the people, the smart people, they understand the situation can jump. And this, this period of incredible opportunity for the people that are creative and understand how to create new opportunities, new startup and so on. It's amazing. But uh, of course, uh, how is the say, situation in education? The, 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 the cost online uh, to reorganize the whole cost of education is it's one uh, big issue. I'm not the only one that is saying this. In fact, uh, in the institution, I think there's reconsidering what can happen because uh, uh, the, the issue of the cost uh, is, not, is not new and a lot of parents and a lot of uh, potential students are considering mm. they is worth it to invest uh, 100, 150, 200, whatever is the amount for this uh, and what is the return from that investment, how long it takes. So this is a big issue that of course, uh, I think that everyone is reconsidering, but also I think that we are in a, uh, living a great opportunity to think about the future in a completely different way. I absolutely agree with you. Um, like you mentioned, I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to reinvent design education. I should tell you about this little program that I started called Offsite it's for a different time. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Vincenzo, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being a part of Lens and for sharing with us some of your thoughts and your insights on your personal work. And now as an educator at CCS, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. My contact you can find on the website, uh, uh, LinkedIn, wherever you like. And it's very easy to find me. And it will be also interesting to the larger audience to be contacted in case you have some question. I always enjoy to provide some answer because you know it helps the conversation, helps to make clear what eventually we should do. I appreciate it. Thank you, Hector. Absolutely. And, uh, we will make sure that when we upload this on our website and our YouTube, your contact information is also visible so that people can reach out to you if they have any additional questions. Thank you everyone for being a part of Lens. Have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you so much. Bye.